You may be seated. Today's first scripture, scripture lesson is from Psalm 111. Listen for the word of God. Alleluia. I give thanks to God with everything I've got. Wherever good people gather and in the congregation, God's works are so great. Worth a lifetime of study, endless enjoyment. Splendor and beauty mark his craft. His generosity never gives out. His miracles are his memorial. This God of grace, this God of love, he gave food to those who fear him. He remembered to keep his ancient promise. He proved to the people that he could do what he said. Hand them the nations on a platter, a gift. He manufactures truth and justice, and all of his products are guaranteed to last. Never out of date, never obsolete, rust proof. All that he makes and does is honest and true. He paid the ransom for his people. He ordered his covenant kept forever. He's so personal and holy, worthy of our respect. The good life begins in the fear of God. Do that, and you'll know the blessing of God. His hallelujah lasts forever. Today's second scripture is from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Listen to the word of God. Don't waste your time on useless work, mere busy work, the barren pursuits of darkness. Expose these things for the sham they are. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness where no one will see. Rip the cover off those frauds and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. So, watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God, huge drafts of him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything, any excuse for a song to God, the Father, in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So before we dive into our message today, I think it would be beneficial to note its place in this letter to the new church in Ephesus. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about Paul's encouragement to the church to walk worthy. From the beginning of chapter 4 until now, we've considered that Paul has addressed the church as a whole. And today, we're going to see a manner in which he addresses us as individual Christians and exhorts us in a manner to which we have been called in the same way he's been talking to the whole church in the manner to which they have been called. We've encountered the metaphor of walking several times now in Ephesians. And remember, it applies to us today here at Rapid City First just as much as it did to that church in Ephesus in the first century. In chapter 2 we read, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In chapter 2, verse 10, Paul said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, that we should walk in them. And then in chapter 4, we hear Paul say, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Then in chapter 5, verse 2, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself to us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In verse 8, 
For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And lastly, in verse 15, look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Clearly, Paul has been concerned to open a Christian's mind to the reality of this. The change that has been wrought within us by the Word of God and by the power of the Spirit has produced a new walk, a new way of life that our new creation self should be walking. And as I have said, up to this point, Paul has had the church as a whole in view as he urged us to walk worthy in Christ Jesus. So understand that in our reading today, we have the conclusion to the section that began in chapter 4 where Paul exhorts Christians in general and the church as a whole, male and female, young and old, rich and poor, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they have been called. So let's pay careful attention to what he says. In brief, Paul commands two things as he concludes this section of the epistle. One, he commands Christians to walk in wisdom. And two, he commands Christians to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what does he mean? Paul has taught his audience that they have a new identity in Christ. You are light in the Lord, he says. As light, we expose the darkness that exists in the world. Darkness, driving out the darkness, making Christ visible to the world. As light, we are being transformed, waking up from the darkness in uh, ourselves because the light of Christ is shining in us. Paul brings us to his fifth use of the word walk in Ephesians 4, where we were told to talk worthy of the calling. We were told not to walk like the unbelievers in the world. Paul commands us to walk in love as we imitate God as his children. Then Paul told us to walk as children of light. Ephesians 5.15 gives the final description of how we are to walk so that we can be found walking worthy of the calling. We're to look carefully at how we are walking. Paul is instructing us to carefully watch how we live our lives. How we live our lives matters to God. God cares about the decisions that we make. Are we looking at how we are walking? It's so easy to not pay attention to how we live. We just live for today without considering if we are staying on the path that God has for us. We walk without trying to discern what the will of God is in our lives. We don't look carefully at what would please the Lord. We just go and we forget to look where we're walking. Rebecca and I worry about Rebecca's mom, worry about her falling. She likes looking on her walks at other people and the sky and everything else, and it becomes distracting as she walks. And we're constantly telling her to, to look where you're walking. We tell her this because she's going to fall down if she doesn't look where she's walking. She's going to get hurt if she's not careful. So often we all forget to look where we're walking. We just do what we want to do for today. But Paul says to walk carefully. Look at how you walk. The reason for this is so important because he tells us that the days are evil. The world is full of darkness. What the world says and does is often not godly. What others say and do is often not the way we should live our lives. There's a lot of pressure to conform to the ways and values of the world. And we have to be careful not to fall into sin. So what do we need to do to walk carefully? Walk wisely. Paul says looking at how we walk means to walk wisely and not unwisely. Walking in this world requires wisdom. That's what the wise writer of Proverbs instructs his son and us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Only unwise people do not have fear of the Lord. To walk as wise people and not unwise people means looking to the Lord for knowledge and wisdom. Recall what James instructed Christians. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. 
God is the place of wisdom. God is the giver of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Wisdom doesn't come from within ourselves. Wisdom doesn't come from the world. The world claims to be uh, wise, but Paul tells us in Romans that the world is fools. Look carefully at how we walk means looking to the Lord. And make the best use of your time. The second way that we carefully look at how we are walking is making the best use of our time. The New King James Version reads that we redeem our time. We have to plan to make the best use of our time because days are evil, remember? Idle time turns out that it's easy to become sin time. Having unplanned, unaccountable time is the easiest way to fall into sin. The warning is given to both Christian men and to women. Idleness leads to sin. Note your time each day and make the best use of it to the glory of God. Spend your time understanding what God's will is. That's the second time Paul told us to do this. Go back to Ephesians 5.10 when Paul says, we're to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul says to spend your time understanding what the will of the Lord is, otherwise we're being foolish. A foolish life is a life that's not spent understanding God's will. A wise life that is carefully looking at our walk understands God's will. And then looking carefully at our walk, living is wise and not unwise, and making the best use of our time means not getting drunk, but being filled with the Spirit. Paul commands us not to get drunk with wine. Notice that he doesn't say, do not drink wine. Whether or not you drink wine or some other alcoholic beverage is your choice. But the choice falls into the realm of wisdom. Here we see a contrast of influence. Be under the influence of the Spirit, not under the influence of alcohol. I think it's important for us to know that this is one thing that Paul specifies to show what it looks like not to make the best use of our time and to live foolishly. Don't waste your time in unfruitful activities like getting drunk. So let's not talk about filling ourselves up with alcohol. Drinking parties are also condemned over in 1 Peter, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Paul says don't get drunk because it's a waste of the time that we are to be making the most of. Drunkenness leads to foolishness, reckless decisions and actions. Rather than being drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to a large audience, Dwight L. Moody held up a glass and asked, how can I get the air out of this glass? One man shouted, suck it out with a pump. Moody replied, that would create a vacuum and would shatter the glass. After numerous other suggestions, Moody picked up a pitcher of water and he filled up the glass. There, he said, all the air is now removed. He then went on to explain that victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking out a sin here and there, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. In another story, there was a young man who claimed that whenever he was filled with the Spirit, he was like a bucket with holes in it. The Spirit merely drained out of him. That may be true, his friend said, but even a bucket full of holes can be filled with water and stay filled with water if it's immersed in a river and left there. So what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? Does being filled with the Spirit mean that you're going to perform strange acts, you're going to scream in tongues or yell and dance around? Can you stick your hand in a box of poisonous snakes and not get bit? Does being filled with the Spirit mean that God will start speaking to you in your head? Listen carefully to how Paul describes being filled with the Spirit. There are three aspects that show we're filled with the Spirit. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Being filled with the Spirit means singing with your heart to God. There's no concern here about having a good voice or even enjoying singing because you like music or are musically inclined. Instead, we have drawn our hearts near to God and love God so passionately that our hearts overflow 
with psalms, singing, spiritual songs, hymns. There's a joy that we have in loving and serving the Lord that most expresses it in singing. Rebecca knows her mom is having a good day when she wakes up and hears her mother downstairs singing hymns. That's what we all do when we're singing to each other. We're speaking to each other the overflow of our heart in these songs that we sing. Being filled with the Spirit means your heart speaks to others with uplifting words, making melody from the heart to the Lord. By the way, one way of obeying this command is when Christians gather for corporate worship, just like this. When we're filled with the Spirit, we can't remain alone, but we want to assemble together. Some churches actually use this particular piece of text as the basis for singing in worship. We Methodists just like to sing, kind of like potlucks. The second attribute of being filled with the Spirit is being filled with thanksgiving. I want us to observe the four conditions given for thanksgiving. Giving thanks always. Being filled with the Spirit means that we are thankful to God during good times and bad times. We are thankful in good health and bad health. We are thankful in trial and in prosperity. How can we be thankful always? I offer that the attitude of Job during his trials shows how to be thankful always no matter the circumstances. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's room and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job falls to the ground and worships because he understands that he came into the world with nothing and he's going to leave with nothing. Anything I have is given by the Lord as a blessing. And if it's taken away, it wasn't mine to begin with. Thankfulness at all times comes from an attitude that I deserve none of the blessings that I have. I, therefore, am able to be thankful for gain or loss because it was all by the grace of God that I was given what I have. Number two, give thanks for everything. Be thankful for everything. Exclude nothing from your heart of thankfulness and prayers of thanksgiving. Be thankful for your family. Be thankful for your job. Be thankful for the home you have. Be thankful for your luxuries. Be thankful for everything. Assume nothing. One of the greatest gifts we offer back to God is our perpetual thanksgiving. And this is our challenge. How can we be thankful in every circumstance? It happens with a heart that sees the positive in all that God has done for us rather than what we may lack. Being thankful always for everything only happens in the heart of the humble. Lacking perpetual thankfulness is an indication of pride. Number three, give thanks to God the Creator. God needs to hear our thanksgiving. God needs to hear our appreciation. We need to speak these words to God and let others hear of our dependence on God. Number four, give thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ is the reason that we can be thankful. Consider this for a moment. If Jesus doesn't come to the earth die for our sins and raise up on the third day, then there would be nothing to be thankful for. Our lives would simply be on a collision course to an eternity in the unknown. Christ is the only reason that we can be thankful. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, and there was no greater gift to the world than the gift of Jesus Christ. We show that we are not filled with the Spirit when we are thankless people. Gratefulness must pour from our hearts. The power and authority of Jesus is the means by which we can offer prayer and thanksgiving to God the Father. Look carefully at how you're walking. Be wise in your decisions. Understand the will of the Lord and make the best use of your time because the darkness of evil is all around us. Don't waste your time in your life with drink or other activities that are not fruitful. Fill your life with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit-filled life looks like singing, looks like joyful hearts, thankful hearts in all circumstances for all things. 
if we don't see these things in our lives, then we don't truly understand what Jesus has done for us. How can we not live a life of thankfulness and walk carefully for the Lord when we see the cross of Jesus? Do not be filled with worldliness. Be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians, Paul gave the Colossians the same teaching. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Being filled with the Spirit is letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. When we let the Word of Christ live in our hearts, the result can't help but be singing joy and thanksgiving. Be filled with the Spirit. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you today and every day. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we pray that our actions, everything we do, would be a reflection of who you are and how you love and care for people, a reflection of your wisdom and your justice. Oh God, help us in all the things we do today to reflect the wonder of who you are and how you've called us to live as your children. And not just called us, but enabled us by your Spirit in us to live. Holy Spirit, help us to be imitators of God today and every day. Thanks be to God. Filled to the brim with the nourishment of Jesus Christ, the goodness of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Serve God in all that you do and say, and God's peace will be with you always. Amen.